I just pray this morning that you uh, will lift me up and say I've had a really rough week. I'm battling cancer, and uh, the devil didn't want me here this morning, but we beat him. Hallelujah. And we praise God for that today. I think this is a very appropriate song. It just simply says, it's my desire to live for Jesus. My desire that my equipment will be blessed. There we go. <laughs> It's my desire to live for Jesus. It's my desire to live for Him. So often I pray. you for joining us this morning and uh, you may get another special treat because if I can make it through this message without knocking something over or hurting myself uh, that'll be a miracle in itself 
But we do thank you for joining this morning as we come together to worship the Lord. And we come to worship, worship Him not just through the hearing of the message. Sometimes we think that's the way we come to church, but we worship Him through our music. We worship Him through the follow, through the fellowship, through the giving of our tithes and offering, the reading of God's Word. And I do want to say again a special thanks to the Reverend Joe Sturry for coming and blessing us with his musical talent today. Amen. Now, if you weren't here last week, I've already mentioned it, we had our very first baptismal service. We uh, baptized Joe Wallerman, who happens to be our uh, church secretary. And we use the baptism of Jesus as the illustration. And what I found so interesting is the baptism of Jesus is actually the very beginning of his ministry. It's where he's actually stepping out for the first time to say that he is who he says he is. And in that very beginning, nobody had heard his message yet. And yet he gives us this physical picture of a spiritual truth. Jennifer died to her sin. She was resurrected alive in Jesus. And there was victory in Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus, right there at the very beginning of his ministry, he gives us this physical picture of a spiritual way that we're going away with the old self, putting on a new self. Jesus shows us that we die and that we're resurrected. In the very beginning of his ministry, he shows us this physical spirit picture of the spiritual truth that he's about proclaiming to the world that he will have victory over even death itself. Now, some of you would like to see that message. It's up on our YouTube channel, I believe, which is www.youtube.com forward slash the Odyssey Church, and it should be up by the end of the week on our website as well. But today we're going to start a two-part sermon series. It's very short. It's called The Lesson and the Test. So as we begin the message, I just simply want to start out by asking you a question. How many of you in here, how many times in your life have you felt that maybe God was trying to teach you something? And then right after that, he gives you a test, right? Yeah. He tries to teach you. Now, if you're a pastor, you get to live this every week because it seems like no matter what I'm going to speak on, God sort of puts it into my life. If I'm speaking on anger, that week I, I have so much anger in me, God teaches me how to deal. If I'm teaching on forgiveness, God puts some of the most unforgiving people in my life and makes me have to forgive them. I mean, every time I try to speak a message, God places the lesson and then he gives me this test. And I keep failing the test. I don't know about you guys, but I feel there's some tests. I've been going around that mountain so far, so many times, that I feel like I've dug a trench. I'm thinking someday I want to preach on winning the lottery. And maybe he'll test me in that as well, but I can't find the scriptures to back it up. So, but again, so often in our lives, Jesus sends this, this test into our life, and then right afterwards he sends a storm to see if we've been taught what we're supposed to talk. Now, when I was in school, and this is what I'm finding in my life, when we fail the test the first time and we get to do a makeup test, the makeup test is usually harder than the original test, right? Yeah. So we call this, this the Bible, so often we call it the living word, and, and there's a reason for that. Now many of you probably already know the story of the feeding of the 5,000, which we're going to talk about today. It's a passage I've heard a lot of, a lot of sermons on, but have you ever thought about the fact that the feeding of the 5,000 is a lesson that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, and if you're a Christian, that means he's trying to teach us, and then immediately following that, he gives them a test. And that test is the walking on the water of the stormy seas. The lesson, part one, is the feeding of the 5,000. Part two is the test. And so often these stories are taught in different contexts. You'll hear one at the beginning of the year, one at the end. And, and we don't put them together like God puts them together. Jesus had taught the previous evening. And then immediately... His disciples are given a test. They're given a lesson. We're looking at the lesson this morning. We're going to be looking at the feeding of the 5,000. And next week, we're going to be looking at the stormy sea. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn them into the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew is the record of Jesus' life as recorded by an eyewitness. Matthew chapter 14, and it's verses 13 through 21. Now this is the feeding of the 5,000. But commentaries disagree strongly about how many people that were actually there that day. 
We know that there were 5,000 men, but in verse 21, we're taught that there's also men and women there. So we, we, we believe in, and, and we can pretty be sure there were at least 15 to 20,000 people there that day. But you know, if they had a family like me, with four children and a wife, you know, that would put it up to 30,000 people. And there are commentaries that believe there were as many as 50,000 people there because women weren't included in the count and there was widows, there were, were those that didn't have a spouse, and, and some of the children may have followed along with the large crowds without their parents being there. But whatever number we agree on, we know there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the crowd that day. Now, if you're in school, you know, for the kids that are in school, we already know that the teacher will give us a lesson, and then they'll give us a test. And, and, and we don't always like the lesson, but I haven't met anybody yet that likes to take a test. Even as we get older, and we have to take a test for a job, or we have to take a test at the DMV, or we have to take a test for anything. Most people don't like to take a test, and I think the reason for that is they're afraid they're going to fail a test. Everybody gets nervous when we have to take a test. And I thought, you know, maybe we wouldn't mind so much taking a test if we understood what the test was for. So often, when I was in school, I, I thought teachers gave tests just because they were mean. I, you know, I thought they gave tests, and especially pop quizzes, because they just sort of wanted to get back at us because we weren't always so pleasant to them. But a test isn't designed to reveal the student to the teacher. A test is actually designed to reveal the student to the student. The test is designed to see if you're ready to go to the next level, to see if you're ready to graduate so that when you go to the next level that you're prepared. Amen. So, so if we would understand what the test is about, sometimes I don't think we would mind the test as much. Now the feeding of the 5,000 is the lesson, the storm which we look at next week is the test. And Jesus, what he wanted to do, he wanted to know if his disciples were ready to go to the next level. He wanted to know if they had been taught and they had learned the things that they were supposed to learn so they could go to the next level. Now, that the miracle, the miracle of the loaves, the feeding of the 5,000 in this lesson, so that's what we're going to start with this week, and then next week we're going to move on to the test. In the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus attempts to teach us this great truth. And just in case you fall asleep while I'm speaking, that wouldn't be the first time that happened. Or in case you, uh, you know, if you nod off or you get distracted or you count the seal pilot and, and you have to leave, I want to give you the big idea of today's message right up front. I don't want you to miss it. And I believe the great truth of this lesson is God, Jesus is just trying to teach his disciples, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of your problems, you need to trust him. That's a simple message. Trust Jesus and everything. And then the stormy sea is the, is the test that we face in our life, in the disciples' life, to see if that truth has become real in our life. Now, in order for God to test us, He has to send a storm into our life sometimes. And sometimes the storm comes from Him, as we're going to see next week. Anybody got a storm in their life right now? <laughs> You lie, you fry. You know? We all go through it. Somebody pastor told me one time there's only three types of people. Those that are headed into a storm, those in the midst of a storm, and those that are headed out of a storm. We all have storms in our life. But I thank God that he is a patient teacher. Amen. Because like the disciples, so often we fail the test because we simply don't understand. We simply don't learn our lesson. And we fail the test that God stands into our life. So I'm going to give you, ask you to give your attention to God's Word. But before I do, you know, some of you may be saying, well, how do you know that this is the lesson and that the storm is the test? And in order to do that, I, I'm just going to read a little bit from the Gospel of Mark. In Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 49 through 52, we find that immediately after the feeding of 5,000, Jesus sends his disciples, Jesus puts his disciples into the boat, and sends them across the seas while he's going to go up and spend time with his heavenly father. And while they're out on the stormy sea, they see what appears to be a ghost and they get very scared. Gospel Mark says, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Do not be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. 
Then he climbed in a boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed. And the next sentence is what tells us that the feeding of the 5,000 was the test, or was the lesson, and the stormy sea was a test. It says, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. See, Mark ties the story of the storm and sea in with the feeding of the 5,000. And we know they didn't learn their lesson. They know, we know they failed the test because it says they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. So if you'll give your attention to God's Word, I'm going to read all the verses from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21, and then we'll see how God puts them together, and we'll try to get the picture before our heart. And if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. The words will be up here on the screen. It says, as soon as Jesus heard the news, now I'll tell you what the news is in just a few minutes. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, in the beginning of chapter 14, what we find out is that Jesus, friend, his cousin, the guy who had baptized him, baptized him, which we talked about last week, John the Baptist, has been executed. That the King Herod had had a party, and during that party he made a promise to his stepdaughter that whatever she asked, she would give him. And Herod's wife said, ask him for John the uh, Baptist's head on a platter. And that's what happened. He had to live up to his word. He cut John's head off. So, so we find out that Jesus had heard this news, that John was dead. He left in a boat. Well, I'll find him. In. He left in a boat, and, and he just <coughs> wanted to be alone. We also find out from the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus had had so many people coming to him, the disciples had been working so hard that they hadn't even had a time to eat. That they were tired, they were hungry. Jesus has just heard the news that somebody he loved had, had died, and, and he says, come by yourselves and let's just go to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus and his disciples had been working so hard, they didn't even have time to eat, and they're hungry and they're tired and they just found out that his cousin, the man who baptized his friend, has been executed, and, and, and he just wants to get somewhere and be by himself. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, or, or maybe you had a bad day at work, maybe you're tired, you're, you're weak, and, and, and all you can think about is just getting under covers, just going somewhere and being by yourself. And, and, and you make all the preparation, you're ready to do that, and then all of a sudden the kids come in, or there's a phone call, or work calls, or, or there's a problem, the bills are there, you know. You just want to get by yourself, and you just can't do it. Something else is drawing your attention. See, that's what happened to Jesus that day. The, the crowds have followed him, and he just wants to get by himself. And as he steps off the boat, as soon as he steps off the boat, we see that the crowds were right there. They're there to meet him. The crowds heard where he was, and they headed, and they followed on foot. But here's the first observation. This is the first thing I want you to see this morning about our Lord Jesus Christ. He's just heard about the execution of somebody. He's heard. He's hungry. He's tired. They've been working. But this huge crowd of people have followed him. And they just don't come and say, hey, we're sorry. They come and bring him more work. They bring more stuff for him and the disciples to do. It says, Jesus saw the huge crowds. He stepped out of the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. They didn't even give him a break. They brought the sick. They, they, they sort of surrounded him. But look at that last sentence. He had compassion on them. See, our God is a God of compassion. Jesus sees your needs. He knows your hurt. And he sees it. And he has compassion on it. It means he cares for you. He loves you. The Apostle Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9. He says, Praise be to God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles. 
When Jesus sees our hurts, he knows about them. It's not that he ignores them. He's the God of compassion. He's there to comfort us. And it doesn't say he, compa- he has compassion on some of our foes. It doesn't say he comforts us in a few of our foes. He says, I comfort you in all your troubles. He sees our suffering. He has compassion on us. And he comforts us. But here's where I believe Jesus begins to teach the lesson. He's teaching his disciples. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that means you're a disciple. That means he's trying to teach us. He wants us to become aware that there is no problem, there is no circumstances that's too big for him to handle. He expects us to do our part, though. He says, I'll help you out, but I need you to do something as well. Jesus told there's some problems on our own we simply can't deal with. There are impossible situations, and sometimes he's the one who allows the problems to come into our life. Some problems we can't fix with the resources we have. And we need to learn to trust him. We need to learn to trust the God of compassion to take care of what we can't take care of on our own. And it might be a marriage. It might be a financial issue. It might be a problem with a family member. It might be a health issue. It might be an addiction. There are all kinds of problems that we can have in our life that we simply can't handle on our own with the resources that we have. Now the illustration that Jesus uses is this hungry crowd where there's nowhere near enough food to feed them at all. It says that evening the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. And it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so we can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. So they can buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, this isn't necessary. You feed them. To which the disciples says, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. That's all we have. You know, that last statement really shows the heart of the disciples. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. We can't do it. it it's impossible. What, what were the disciples looking at? They were looking at their circumstances. They were looking at what they had. They weren't looking at what they did have. Don't we do the same thing? You know, we look at our problem. We look at our circumstances. And we say, it's impossible. I don't have enough. I can't take care of this. Simon says, with five loaves and two fish, and there's 40,000 people here, there's no way we can do that. I mean... Five loaves of bread and two fish, that's not even going to feed a pastor lunch. He didn't really say that, but it's true. How many times, how many times do we take our problem and we just look at the circumstances? We look at the problem, we say, This is impossible. I can't fix this. And nobody can fix this. And we forget we're in the very present of Jesus Christ. And we know in our hearts, He'll never leave us. Or forsake us. We know he's right there with us. But we look at the problem. We take our eyes off of him. And we say. I don't have what it takes to fix my marriage. I I don't have what it takes to fix my finances. I I, I don't have what it takes to fix my addiction problem. I don't have what it takes to get my health back. I don't have what it takes to fix my problem. Whatever our circumstances. Whatever our problem is. We forget we serve a God of compassion. And on our own, we don't have what it takes. It's like trying to feed 5,000 men plus their children and their wives with just five loaves of bread and two fish. Aren't you glad? In Luke 137, it says, For nothing is impossible with God. And it doesn't say, For nothing is impossible for God. It says, Nothing is impossible with God. Which means... That nothing is impossible for us if we have God on our side. First place we need to look when we don't have enough, when we don't have what it takes, is to the Lord Jesus Christ. The God of compassion. And not to our circumstances. Not to our problems. There were only five loaves of bread and two fish. And that's all the disciples saw. And they missed. They didn't see the God of compassion who was standing right in front of them, who was right in their presence. And so often we do the same thing. We look at our circumstances, we look at our problems, and we forget that the Holy Spirit is right here, right with us, and and we're seeing the problem, but we're not seeing Jesus. And you would think, 
You, you would think, if, if you read the scriptures and read them in order, you would think the disciples would already have this figured out. I mean, by this time, they'd already seen Jesus cast out demons. They'd already seen Jesus heal a man with leprosy. They'd already seen Jesus heal a man with a crippled arm or a crippled hand. They'd seen Jesus heal a woman with an issue of blood. They had seen Jesus turn water into wine. They'd he'd seen Jesus heal a man lying by a pool in Bethesda. They'd seen Jesus heal a paralyzed man and tell him to get up and walk out with his bed. They'd seen him heal a Roman servant. They'd seen him raise a girl from the dead. And you think to yourself, what is it going to take for these guys, for these disciples to learn to trust Jesus? And yet I look at my own life. I look at the circumstances and the problems I've had in the past and how God has provided a miracle in my life. And then the next problem comes along. The next situation comes along and I take my eyes off of them again. And I forget about all the things he's already done for me. And I begin to look at my problem again. And I say, this is impossible. I can't do it. And I forget to look at Jesus again. Jesus is telling us, it's a lesson. He's teaching us just to simply trust him. And we can't do it on our own. He's not giving us a lesson that if they worked real hard and they did something right there, that they could have fixed it. It's an impossible situation. Sometimes we don't have the resources to fix it. But Jesus has seen the situation. Jesus has seen your situation. And he has compassion. Disciples still haven't figured out yet. Just like some of us sometimes. That they can trust Jesus to provide for them regardless of what the problem is. They're still looking at their circumstances. They're still looking at the problem. They're not looking at him. I think, you know, I'm the same way at times. Maybe some of you are as well. God provides for us over and over and over again. And yet the next problem comes around and, that, and we begin to look at our circumstances again and we forget the God of compassion and we don't trust Him to provide. But then here's where, here's where it gets a little deeper. Here's where it gets a little harder because Jesus says, Wait, you, you can't do it without me. It's an impossible situation. But then He says, I'm not going to do it without you. By ourselves, we can't, and without us, he won't. See, Jesus could have provided without the disciples coming to him, but he didn't. He could have made their hunger go away, but he didn't. He told the disciples they had to do something. He says, bring them here. Bring these hungry people here, he said. And then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven, and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples. He didn't feed the people, he gave it to the disciples, and the disciples distributed it to the people. On our own, we cannot. Without us, he will not. But when we put our trust, when we put our faith in him, together we can. He takes what we have, no matter how small, no matter how insufficient, and he blesses it. And then he gives it back to us. So that we can use it for his glory and so that we can bless others. See, Jesus isn't only the God of compassion. He's also the God of miracles. He gave thanks and broke the load. Then he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples distributed to the people. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day. In addition to all the women and children. It's a miracle. Five loaves of bread and two fish feed 15, 20, 30, 40, 50,000, whatever you believe. But a lot more people than five loaves and two fish is freer. And he's the God of compassion. He's the God of miracles. But look, not only is he the God of compassion, he's, God of he's the God of abundance. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women. But they had 12 baskets left over. They had more after they were done than what they started with. He's the God of compassion. He's the God of miracles. He's also the God of abundance. And, and some have said, and I don't know whether you ever thought about this, it was pointed out to me, that this is, this is the story of an unnecessary miracle. When we see back in the 15th birthday, that, that the disciples said, hey, just send him into town. He could have sent him into town. They could have fed themselves. And remember, they met Jesus on the other side. They just simply walked around. They could have walked back the other way, couldn't they? Gone back to their houses and everything. And, it, and it, at the very best, it was a temporary miracle. Because everybody would get hungry again. And they need to eat again, right? 
But God feels so long, so strongly that we learn to trust Jesus. This is the only miracle that Jesus ever does that's recorded in all four Gospels. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the only miracle Jesus does that's recorded in all four miracles. So it's got to be important. It has to be important to God. It has to be important to the Holy Spirit that we learn to trust Jesus. And I think the reason behind that is because that trust is the key to any relationship, right? You can't have a relationship with somebody you don't trust. Trust is the key to our relationship with God. We have to trust Him for our salvation. But let me tell you something, folks. You know, so often we, we sort of beat people over the head and say, Hey, you want to go to heaven when you die? Trust in Jesus isn't just about going to heaven when we die. Our God is a God of compassion. And it's not just after we die. It, it's right now. We learn from the lesson. Jesus is teaching. He sees our needs. He sees our hurt. And he sees our suffering. And he has compassion for us. He's a God of miracles. Not just in the next life. But in this life. Right here. Right now. He sees what we need. He has compassion. And he has the power. And he has the ability to give us what we need. The principal lesson is to trust Jesus. Even when the situation looks impossible. Even when it doesn't look like it could ever happen. On our own, we cannot, and without us, He will not. But when we learn to trust Him, when we bring Him whatever it is we have, no matter how small, no matter how insufficient, He'll multiply what we have and make it more than we need. John 10.10, in 10, the King James Version says, I have come that they may live life, and they may live it more abundantly. See, God doesn't just want us... Sometimes people... I used to, we used to go to church, and a guy said, you know, sometimes Christians look like bullfrogs dipped in vinegar. God does not want us just to survive the Christian life. He wants us to live it and live it more abundantly. Amen. Amen. See, the problem is we get confused by what more abundant is. When we think of more abundant, we think of worldly terms. We think we got more money. We think we got a better marriage. We think we got better health. We think we got a better job. We think we got more friends. But God says, I, I don't abundance to me is not abundance in material worldly things. Abundance. I give you is so that others can see my glory so they can learn to trust me as well. See, Jesus could have given people the food himself. But he took what little bit the disciples had and he blessed it and he multiplied it and gave it back to them and told them to distribute it. See, we're the hands and feet of Christ here in this world. And when God blesses us, we're to take that blessing and we're to use it to bless others. Amen. It was an impossible situation. There were 5,000 men, plus their wives, plus their children, and they had two fish and five loaves of bread. It's late. Everybody's hungry. And Jesus says, you feed them. And the disciples just simply looked at the five fish and the two bread, or the five uh, loaves of bread and the two fish, and said, we can't do that. That's impossible. Is there somebody in here today that maybe has an impossible situation? There's something going on in your life. And it just looks impossible. Maybe it's in your finances. Maybe it's in your health. Maybe it's in your business. Maybe it's in your marriage. But some area of your life, you have this situation. And looking at the situation, it is impossible. Maybe God is just trying to teach you to trust Him. He's showing you on your own with what the resources you have, you're not going to be able to handle this situation. It's impossible. You simply can't do it. And if you don't invite Jesus into your situation, if you don't ask Him to take what little bit you have and you don't turn it over to Him, then He's not going to do it. But if you'll just trust Him and you'll give Him what little bit that you have, He will bless it and He will multiply and He'll do that so you can bless others. The key idea this morning is that we need to learn to trust Jesus and here's the lesson. And maybe you all can say this with me. I cannot without Jesus. He will not without me. Together we can. Amen. Amen. I cannot without Jesus. He will not without me. But together we can. See, Jesus could have provided manna. I mean, God did that in the desert. He didn't do it for just one meal. He didn't do it for just 5,000 people. He fed people in the desert for 40 years, and there were over a million people there. 
But he's teaching us to trust him. And in order for us to trust him, we have to take what we have, even if it's insufficient, even if it's too small, even if it looks impossible, and give it to him. And sometimes, I, I don't know about you, sometimes I'm just like those disciples were. And I just say, Lord, it's impossible. I don't have enough. Maybe that's where somebody is today. There, there is not enough of my marriage for you to fix it. There is not enough of my finances for you to fix it. There's not enough of my health for you to fix it. And Jesus saying, it's just bring me what you have. And give it to me, and then you watch me bless it. You watch me multiply it. See, that's all that God ever expects from us. He doesn't expect us to bring what we don't have. He only expects us to bring what we do have. And when we trust Him, and we bring Him what little we have, and we know it's insufficient, and we know it's not enough, He blesses it, and He multiplies it. On your own, you cannot. And without you, he will not. But when you put your resources in all their insufficiency and you lay them in his hands, maybe, just maybe, he'll lift them up to God and he'll bless them and he'll multiply them. See, when we take our limited resources and we put them with his infinite power, it's no longer our resources. See, we're in union with Christ and we're trusting Him and it's no longer Him but Him and us and together we can. And God works all this out for His glory. This is the lesson I think God is trying to teach all of us. Just trust Jesus. Hallelujah. And maybe, I, I was talking to a, a young woman this week and she's looking at her problems and she's looking at her circumstances and she's looking and she's missing Jesus. Don't we do the same thing? Mm -hmm. And she has an impossible situation. I know her situation. But I also know we serve a God of compassion. That's right. And we serve a God of abundance. Amen. And we serve a God of miracles. Yes. And I sort of see what God is doing in her life, but she's mm -hmm. missing it because she's not looking at Jesus. She's looking at her problems. That's, right. That's what we do. Amen. You know... Maybe that's what's happened to some of us. You know, we're just looking at this impossible situation. What seems possible in human terms is simply an opportunity to God. Amen. An opportunity to let the world see His glory. Amen. Amen. See, the disciples only did what they could. They collected what little bit they had, all that was available, and then they watched God do the impossible. See, that's all God expects from us. Just take what we have. Just do what we can do. Bring in what we have. But here's the thing. So many of us, we hold on for our stuff like this, and we don't do this. Amen. He could have never blessed the loaves and the fishes and let they were placed in his hands. Amen. Amen. See, we do what we can, and we trust God to do the impossible. This morning, are you looking at Jesus, or are you looking at your circumstances? Are you looking around, or are you looking up? Come on. Come on. Are you looking at what you don't have or are you looking at what you do have? Yes. Because you have Jesus Christ. Yes. You have the God of abundance. Yes. You have the God of compassion. Yes. You have the God of miracles. You have the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Are you looking at your limited resources or are you looking at God's unlimited resources? Are you looking at your lack of resources and letting them blind you to the power of God? My God. You're going through an impossible situation this morning. Right. This is what I want you to do as you leave here. And that is simply trust Jesus. Take what little bit you have and give it to him. And wait for Jesus to do a miracle and justify what you have so that he can bless it. Just take your insufficient supply. Don't forget to look to God to meet your needs and the needs of others. Even when the situation looks impossible. Just take what little bit you have and you offer it up to Jesus. And maybe it's your finances. And you say, Lord, the bills are this big. My finances are this little bit. But I'm going to give you this little bit. Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. Maybe it's your job. Lord, I go to work every day and I hate it. I, I just I go to work and, and, and I just feel like I'm beat down. Lord, it's not the job I want, but I, I'm going to give you my job. And I'm going to turn it over to you. And I'm going to try to be a witness for you while I'm there. And, and Lord, just take this job and, and bless others to it. Yes. And, 
And maybe it's your health, you know. Yes. Lord, doctor, I just had a bad doctor report, and, and the doctor says there's no hope. But Lord, I, I, I've gone through it, and I've read the scriptures, and I, and I see that Jesus is a great physician. And, and, and I've read the stories in the books where God has healed people when the situation is possible. And Lord, I don't know if you will or not, but here's my health, what little bit there is left, and I'm going to lift it up to you. And I hope you bless it and multiply it, Lord. Not for my glory, but for your glory, so I can go out and bless yes. others. Yes. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's another reason. I don't know what it is, but just bring it to Jesus. Yes. Jesus has already taken the first step. Oh, the Lord. Word says that we love because He first loved us. That's right. He loves us. He's waiting for us to come to Him and give Him what we have. And the first place we need to look is not to our circumstances, not to our problems, but to Jesus Christ. Trust Him even if your situation looks impossible. Uh, now I'm going to ask, ask Joe to come on up here and just, just play a little bit. And he's going to close us in a song in a few minutes. But I, I do want you to know this. Take your you know, on our own, we don't have the resources to fix some of our problems. Mm -hmm. And with, without us, God won't do it. But when we take the little bit that we have and we turn it over to Him, it's not in our power, but it's the power that lives within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not we and our resources. It's not He apart from our resources. It's He through we. And that may not be good English, but it is certainly a great principle. I can't do it alone. He won't do it alone, but together, there's nothing that's impossible. Amen. Us trusting Jesus, Jesus working through us. But we have to do what the disciples said. We have to take what little bit we have and we have to place it in Jesus' hands. And if you're going through a situation like that this morning, I just ask you, we're going to open up the altars. I want to remind you that the great thing about our God is He takes whatever we have. And He takes us where we are. And then He brings us to where He wants us to be. Maybe it's time, you know, to bring it to the altar and just hold it up to God and say the situation looks hopeless, Lord. It's impossible. What I have here is just not enough. And then just release it to Him. And maybe, just maybe, Jesus will hold it up and He'll bless it. The God of compassion, the God of miracles, the God of abundance, so that we can have more than we had when we started. Simply trust Jesus in every and all circumstances. You know, you think about those bread and that fish and how greatly they were used by God. 2,000 years later, they're still being used for His glory. But they had to be placed in His hands first. And maybe there's somebody in here today that needs to place their very lives into the hands of Jesus so that He can save your soul. And why does He do that? Because he loves you. Why does he do that? So you can be used for his glory. Well, maybe this is where I have been and so often return to. You know, we're already saved. We already believe in God's power. But we still think we're in control of our life, don't we? And we don't let Jesus be in charge of our life. If that's you this morning, we, we do. We open up the altars and we just ask you to trust Him to do what you cannot do on your own and what He will not do without you. And that is prepare you for greatness. Prepare you to be used by Him. So I challenge you as the body of Christ this morning to come out before the Lord, to call on His name and ask Him to move in power in your life and the life of those around you. To take what little bit you have and all its insufficiency and begin to multiply it. To bless you. Not just so that you can have abundance. But so that you can be used for His glory. And then watch Him bless others through you. Watch Him multiply that blessing. As you multiply your witness to others. Reverend Joe Scurry is going to lead us in the closing hymn. And if you have a need, if you have something, if you want to come up here and, and pray with me, that's great. Or pray with Reverend Bruce Curry or somebody else. If not, I'll be in the prayer room, which is the door on the right as you leave here. 
just take what you have, what little bit you have, and all its insufficiency. You know it's too small. You know it's impossible. But give it to Jesus. Hold it up before Him and ask Him to bless it, multiply it, and use it for His glory. Joe's going to lead us with God be with you till we meet again. May God, God be with you. May God, God be with you. May God. Father, we know little is much when you are in it. But help us, Lord, to bring what little bit we have and trust you. Help us see that when we trust you, what seems to be enough, what seems to be too little, what seems to be insufficient, all of a sudden becomes abundance. Father, if there's one in here this morning that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, may today you begin to stir their heart. May they begin to see the living God the living Jesus. Lord, may they put their trust in Him. And Father, for those that are here today and that are going through a situation that's impossible, may you take what little bit they have. May you hold it up to your Father. May you bless it and multiply it for your glory so that others can be blessed through them. Father, we pray together in prayer. We agree. Lord, help us to go out, glorify your name, by the witness of your Son, and by the power of your Spirit. Amen. Amen. I bless you all. I hope you enjoyed today's service. We pray that you return and worship with us once again. God bless you all. May the Lord bless you exceedingly and mightily, more than you ever even dreamed or imagined.